Hello guys, welcome to the Parson series and this is part one of chapter number seven. It's a very, very interesting and very important chapter for you guys where we are going to talk about the history taking as well as the interpretation of the symptoms. So this is something that is really required while you are attending your clinics and also when you are solving the clinical uh, scenario kind of a questions. Okay. So, as you know that eyes are extremely sensitive structures, they are sensitive uh, not only to the light and images but also to the touch and pain. So, one of the sense organs is eye and uh, I think you will agree with me that out of all the sense organs, this is uh, really very, very sensitive. So, it is therefore found that the ocular diseases frequently leads to the symptomatic disturbances some of which can be non-specific, some of which can be diagnostic and uh, there are so many ocular side effects of the systemic drugs, there are so many ocular manifestations of the systemic diseases. Um, more often than not, we are able to diagnose one of the important chronic diseases due to some manifestations in the eye. So, I think this is really, really important knowing the uh, clinical symptomatology in the eye. Ocular symptomatology can be categorized into dose caused by the anomalies of ocular motility, anomalies of the ocular surfaces and the abnormalities which are affecting the visual apparatus. So, they have tried to classify it into three forms. One is your uh, the ocular motility, second is your ocular surfaces and third is your the ocular apparatus. Visual apparatus means the ophthalmology part which is responsible uh, for your neural control and uh, the visual apparatus. So, first we will start with the anomalies of the ocular motility. Whenever you have some problem with the extraocular muscles that may manifest uh, as a asthenopia, eye strain, there is some difficulty in uh, seeing the things, have a sensation of uh, heaviness or we have got the tiredness in the eyes, we have got blurring of the vision uh, after reading or after doing some near work or after doing the work in the dim uh, vision uh, or, or the patient may have diplopia or the squint is visible itself. So, all these things, see these will help you in understanding that when you have to think about the squint. So, when you are um, getting all these kind of complaints, what you have to think is the disorder in the ocular motility or the squint. Okay, let us talk about asthenopia. Now, uh, this is a frequent question uh, of the students that when you see the squint, okay, when the squint is manifest, that is not a problem. Immediately you come to know that there is some problem with the ocular motility and you have a uh, problem with the neuromuscular uh, coordination. But what about the latent squint? Many a times, uh, the parents, especially the mothers are coming that uh, the, uh, the child is having some eye strain, complaining of those kind of things, not able to concentrate, not able to focus or uh, doing the near work in the dim light. So, all sort of complaints. So, a very important thing there is the asthenopia which can actually result from the disturbances of the ocular motility. This is defined as a weakness or fatigue of the eyes. And this weakness of the fatigue uh, that we get is due to the prolonged close work or may also occur after extended viewing at a distance. Prolonged close work is the often uh, cause that is associated with asthenopia, but you will amazed, you will get amazed to see that even when we are doing the prolonged distance work, just say uh, we are doing the watching of film or the television, uh, then also uh, the person has this asthenopia. Now, why do we have this? This actually occurs due to the insufficiency of convergence. We can have phorias, that is the latent squint or other extra muscle imbalances. We can have um, uncorrected refractive errors, incorrect refractive correction, especially of the astigmatism, early presbyopia. So, all these are actually, uh, you can say that these are more or less causes of the latent squint. Uh, in all those causes of the latent squint, we actually do not have squint, uh, but there is something uh, which is there and um, when that uh, fusional reserves get over and uh, falls short, then the squint gets manifested. So, we can have the insufficiency of convergence, some extracular muscle imbalances 
or we have uncorrected refractive errors and um, that is why the child is trying to accommodate more especially in cases of uncorrected hypermetropias and um, over usage of the extracular muscles or there can be a faulty correction of the astigmatism that also creates a lot of uh, disturbance so all these things can lead to asthenopia the patient complains of now another important thing is how will you uh, get to know that this patient is having asthenopia patient will say aching or burning of the eyes heaviness of the eyelids together with the headache so now this is also art of understanding what does uh, what is the patient complaining of and what actually patient has uh, many a times if the patient is literate he or she is able to tell you accurately what is the exact feeling he or she can say i have a eye strain but uh, uh, having seen all kind of patients are there related to the education related to the strata they may not use the correct word so you should be able to identify they will say that there is a burning there is aching uh, they are feeling heaviness over the eyelids or they are saying some kind of headache so you should be able to identify that what is the complaint that the patient is saying and what is the actual problem complaints of blurring of vision or doubling of letters about 20 to 30 minutes more specifically due to insufficiency of convergence and a very very typical symptom if the patient is saying then there is a complaint of blurring of the vision or there is doubling of the letters after reading 20 to 30 minutes and i think many of you uh, would be able to um, relate with this many of you start feeling uh, diplopia or there is a doubling of certain letters when you have already read for uh, 20 minutes or so so that is that there is a insufficiency of convergence okay now we talk about the binocular diplopia now diplopia is a relatively simpler uh, symptom simpler uh, in the sense that it is simpler to understand because uh, once a patient has diplopia obviously that uh, life becomes hell but uh, for as an ophthalmologist as an observer uh, if you get the complaint of diplopia then life becomes more simple to evaluate uh, it is a subjective impression of two images of the same object seen by the patient when two eyes are open and uh, if the person closes one of the eye you get only one image so you are getting diplopia when both eyes are open all right now this is due to the inability of the two eyes to move together synchronously so therefore we are not directed towards uh, a same target so basically there is misalignment of the two visual axes and uh, because I have misalignment of the two visual axes so both are not in correspondence to each other when I do not have the normal retinal correspondence the fovea of both the eyes are not corresponding I will not have the simultaneous perception now if I do not have the simultaneous perception there will be no fusion and therefore no binocular single vision this complaint is encountered in the patient with the extracular muscle paresis, restrictive squint or the displaced globe. So I can get diplopia either in the true paralytic squint or it can be a restrictive kind of squint or there is a true displacement of the globe. All right. Now another important thing is the diminution of vision. Diminution of vision I think is the most universal complaint in a, of the patients who are coming to the ophthalmology OPD and uh, this is most widely used DD as well. Now the common complaint of the decreased vision give an important clue to the accurate diagnosis. Important leading questions related to its onset would be the age at onset, whether it was gradual or sudden, uh, both eyes simultaneously affected or not, characterization of the loss of vision its duration progression worsening improving pattern constant intermittent more for the distance more for the near episodic periodic uh, associated symptoms pain redness watering photophobia photopsia floaters diplopia negative or positive scotoma and peripheral field defects now all these words you have uh, used already in your notes in ophthalmology and I keep on telling you that all these things are very very important when you are assessing a patient uh, you have to take them as DDs whenever the patient you are uh, examining is having the diminution of vision ask for the time uh, uh, what was the age of onset how much is the duration whether it is sudden whether it is um, chronic gradual or it is painless painful stationary progressive 
the distance of vision more clumsy at the daytime more clumsy at the night time more for the distance more for the near associated symptoms floaters scotoma so all these things because you know you have so many things in ophthalmology and uh, so many diseases can uh, be uh, resulting in the sudden painless loss of vision or so many diseases can be giving you gradual painless progressive loss of vision so obviously i cannot just rely on these two things i have to ask about the other things patient may not be telling uh, uh, me about uh, the photopsy or the floaters he or she may not be able to correlate that this is a thing that may cause uh, the diminution of vision pain uh, is one thing most of uh, them will tell them by themselves also because that is hurting them but otherwise other things have to be asked because they may be you know realizing that there is a floater or a black spot going on but they may not be able to correlate that this has to be told to you at the same time so all these things have to be asked for and uh, when, while you are taking the clinical history whatever things uh, is confirmed that the patients that this is there this is there this is there that will become your positive history now if you have asked for uh, maybe uh, 10 things three he say he, it's there so those three things will become a positive history and the rest of the seven things you have to say that there is no history of so you are ruling out certain things due to those uh, negative seven symptoms so that is again really important okay now coming to the frequent causes of decreased vision what are the frequent causes of the decreased vision apart from the disturbances of the vision uh, that we have discussed their origin um, in the eye itself may be there and uh, uh, other can be dependent upon the uh, nervous pathways also okay there are also certain visual field effects then some can be peripheral so this you already know you have learned about so many kind of visual uh, defects there are so many causes of the diminution of vision it can be optic neuropathy it can be macular degeneration it can be cataract it can be cornea it can be visual field defects it can be visual pathway defects so obviously now first talking about two, two things the myopia and amyrosis amyopia and amyrosis these are the terms which are used for partial and complete loss of sight loss of sight respectively in one or both eyes in the absence of very very important in the absence of ophthalmoscopic or other marked objective lesions so i've got two things one is your amyopia one is amyrosis now amyopia may i have got just the partial one amyopia is the partial while amyrosis is the complete loss in one or both eyes now first talk about the amyopia now this amyopia can be unilateral amyopia or it can be bilateral amyopia so partial loss in one or both eyes so unilateral amyopia is resulting from the psychical uh, depression of the retinal image due to the sensory deprivation so uh, if there is a uh, absence of the stimulation in one of the eye that is your sensory uh, deprivation that can also result in the suppression of one of the eye that is called as a cyclical depression so uh, unilateral amyopia may be due to n isometropia with uni, uh, unilaterally high refractive error a condition curable with suitable spectacles in early life if sufficient perseverance is exercised one of the very very important causes of unilateral amyopia is if i am having unilateral high refractive error so if i am having a very high amount of refractive error in uh, one of my eyes what happens a person continues to see from the other eye do not complain much the work is going on but obviously this patient will develop a uh, preference so other eye will be preferred and uh, slowly and gradually this eye is avoided so person stops looking from this eye no sensory stimulation and due to that deprivation suppression will be there and this eye will go into amyopia while on the other hand if i look at the bilateral amyopia bilateral amyopia is due to your bilateral sensory deprivation if i have bilateral uh, cataract if i have bilateral corneal opacity bilateral high refractive error so if i am having a problem in both the eyes it can be like um, refractive errors in both the eyes cataracts in both the eyes high amount of uh, you know uh, if it is especially high refractive errors corneal opacity and the cataracts bilateral visual loss due to exogenous toxins with a normal fundus that is called as the toxic amyopia then there is also a term called as toxic amyopia toxic amyopia means uh, if i am having and the bilateral visual loss due to the toxins toxins may uh, even the drugs are included 
and the fundus is normal then that is called as the toxic amblyopia but it is presently more accurately termed as toxic neuropathies or toxic retinopathies then you also get the bilateral visual loss in the uremia meningitis and hysteria so again this will help you in taking the history suppose you are having bilateral visual loss and you are not getting any organic lesion you are getting a normal fundus inquire about the toxins inquire about uremia meningitis uh, hysteria maybe their hysteria uh, will go towards the uh, you know psychiatric illness now we come to the bilateral amyrosis now if i talk about the uh, amyrosis first i'll take the bilateral one it occurs particularly in the acute nephritis especially in the pregnancy or after the streptococcal infection uh, in the chronic renal disease now these things will help you in solving the integrated questions with the uh, medicine and ophthalmology um, they may have given you a question about the acute nephritis you are not focusing on the amyrosis and suddenly they ask you about the uh, ophthalmology uh, thing that is your amyrosis or it may be other way around. So whenever there is a bilateral amyrosis, you have to think about the acute nephritis or pregnancy or the streptococcal infection, the chronic renal failure. Uh, the onset of the blindness is uh, usually sudden here. It's rapid, 8 to 24 hours. It is bilateral and complete. The fundus shows no changes. So, uh, there will be absence of the organic changes in both the amyrosis as well as the amlyopia. Uh, there, in some cases, I can even have the coincident hypertensive uh, retinopathy. Vision usually improves in uh, 10 to 18 hours and it is fully restored in about 48 hours. Usually, amyrosis is a word that we are using for the transient obscuration of vision. So, it is uh, improving in uh, 10 to 18 hours, fully restored. It is uh, coming in 48 hours in uremic amyrosis. Now, this is again a well asked question. In uremic amyrosis, the pupils are dilated and they are generally reacting to light but showing that the lower centers are not affected. The condition is probably due to circulation of toxic materials which are acting on the visual centers. And in cases um, during the pregnancy, we have got the uh, eclemptic retinopathy that is also there. So, here the uremic amyrosis is very important, acute nephritis, we have pregnancy, we have streptococcal infection, we have got chronic renal disease, all these things are important. Now, a typical term that is called as amyrosis fugex. Now, what is this amyrosis fugax? Amyrosis fugax is a transient monocular blindness caused by a temporary lack of blood flow either to the brain or to the retina. Transient monocular. So, if I have a transient loss of vision in one eye and that too due to the loss of blood supply. Loss of blood supply to the brain directly or to the retina. Now, it is related to most of the time it is related to the atherosclerosis in the blood vessels which are supplying the blood, uh, brain of the retinal region and uh, resulting from the plaques in the carotid artery. So when I have the carotid artery embolism, carotid artery diseases, I can have this transit ischemic attacks due to the ocular ischemia that may result into the amyrosis. These block an artery for a while and then move on resulting in the loss of vision for the duration of the blockade. So basically why it is transient, they are blocking it and then they are moving in, they are blocking and moving on. So for that particular period where the blockade was on, that time we can have the blockade. Okay, the onset uh, is acute, episode usually lasts for several minutes. So again important thing is that this episode is actually lasting for the several minutes if I talk about the amyrosis. Uh, now the sudden loss may appear as if there is a curtain falling from the above or rising below and vision may be completely absent at the height of the attack. So now if they have given you this line, you may get confused with a curtain like effect in cases of retinal detachment or they can ask you where else you can find this curtain like effect. So it is also in cases of the amyrosis. Recovery uh, will also occur in the same pattern, examination during or shortly after an attack. So you will get to see retinal ischemia. It may be in the form of retinal edema, some hemorrhages and uh, emboli can be there where you have got the fibrin platelet aggregations. They are originating from the surfaces of the atheroma within the carotid artery. So you can have the carotid artery uh, plaques, horinos plaques can be there, atheromas can be there. We can have um, these crystals over the aorta. Repeated episodes of amyrosis fugix indicates the need. Now see, they, they could have asked uh, you this, that um, the person has get so, uh, got so many attacks of um, amyrosis 
okay so whether the patient requires this uh, arteriography or not so it is the repeated attacks of amyloidosis fugix that indicates the need for the arteriography especially if there is transient cerebral symptoms so this is the main uh, thing that could be asked in the question as well okay now we come to the cardiovascular abnormalities now persons having the cardiovascular abnormalities valvular defects arrhythmias even these people can come up with the myrosis so again a very important thing uh, there's no need to cram like dds you people uh, must have seen that uh, you know book says that uh, the dds of this is one two three four one two three four like but if you learn like 1, 2, 3, 4, you will forget also 1, 2, 3, 4. But if you uh, grasp the concept that uh, why do we have a myrosis and uh, what are the conditions where I will face these conditions and obviously they will become the cause of a myrosis. Now, there can be prolapse of the mitral valve uh, that can also give you a certain uh, similar kind of a history. So, all these will become your causes of the myrosis or the DT of the amyrosis uh, then uh, there is another thing called as the fibromuscular hyperplasia it is an entity occurring in young females where i can have the proliferation of the medial muscular coats of the medium sized blood vessels we have carotid artery renal artery vertebral artery and a very very important thing here the uh, angiography will show a string of beads sign so when you have uh, fibromuscular dysplasia okay fibromuscular dysplasia fibro and muscular so you have got the medium sized vessels and uh, there you get this characteristic string bead sign migraine migraine is an occasional cause of the unilateral vision loss and many times what happens that uh, the person is coming up uh, with these kind of symptoms we confuse it with the migraine and we are sending back uh, to the medicine people and uh, then after a couple of weeks they find out that they are not getting improvement with the uh, migraine treatment and then uh, we start evaluating in the other directions. So uh, these uh, some patients with the migraine have a retinal manifestation presumed to be secondary to the vasospasm of the retinal vessels and this may be substantiated by the presence of edema in the retina. Even some uh, certain theories also say that um, in cases of migraine we do have some ischemia and um, vasospasm in the retinal vessels and that is why similar kind of uh, complaints could, could be there. Uh, another important thing is your optic nerve head edema. Optic nerve head edema may you can have brief or transient obscuration of the vision. Uh, again, this is very, very uh, small. Like it, it, it is just 30 to 60 seconds. It may occur bilaterally or unilaterally in patients with asymmetric disc edema. Uh, if I am having an asymmetric disc edema, then uh, that can lead to the increased intracranial pressure. So, giant cell arthritis. So, even the giant cell arthritis can lead to this transient ischemic attacks that is just for 30 to 60 seconds. Then um, another important thing is your uh, venous testis retinopathy. Uh, venous testis retinopathy may also present in a similar way but what are the other things that you have to search for? The microaneurysms, we have punctate hemorrhages, we have got uh, certain patches of neovascularization and uh, the symptom of visual obscuration originates from the ischemia, there is anoxia, there is um, occlusion of the internal carotid artery. So, uh, if I have some occlusion at the level of carotid artery, at the level of, uh, you know, uh, we have seen renal artery, vertebral artery, can you see, they can uh, give you any example. Question could be asked with respect to carotid artery, renal artery, vertebral artery. Then we also saw the, uh, these your uh, fibromuscular dysplasias. Then you have seen the optic nerve decompression, uh, the giant cell arthritis and also we are talking about the internal carotid artery. So, wherever I have uh, this kind of a problem, wherever I have got the ocular ischemic syndrome, I can have this amyrosis. The retinal artery pressure is invariably low and uh, I can also have ischemic orbital pain. It may be prolonged by anoxia which is lessened by lying down. So, look at uh, the picture here and um, what you are going to find. So, if you look at the fundus finding of the venous stasis retinopathy in, uh, of a patient, you can see the occlusion of internal carotid artery, dilated dark and irregular veins. So, look at the picture here. Uh, you are uh, clear cut seeing dilated veins, irregular veins 
so they obviously just by looking at this uh, nobody will ask you to make a diagnosis they will have to give you certain history certain uh, other signs also and along with this if they are giving you this kind of a fundus finding then you are sure that we are dealing with a case of this venous stasis retinopathy and uh, once a diagnosis is uh, sure uh, treatment is not a problem you can easily treat with the aspirin or a percentine may elevate the symptoms okay uh, we can also do this um, this obliteration of the carotid uh, for an isolated arthromatous plague or um, the patients who are having the transient ischemic attacks of the retinal origin they are less likely to develop a hemiplegia um, but uh, those who are having some problem from the cerebral origin okay see i can have the transient ischemic attacks due to some problem uh, in the blood supply of retinal vessels also and the cerebral vessels also now which is more uh, severe so obviously the one which is supplying the cerebral uh, vessels is more severe and uh, that is uh, having more chances to develop the symptoms like stroke and hemiplegia then uh, another important thing is your gaze evoked amyrosis uh, gaze evoked amyrosis is defined as a transient monocular loss of vision occurring in a particular direction so it, like it was a gaze uh, eccentric nystagma similarly is your gaze evoked amyrosis so whenever the person is looking in that particular eccentric gaze then you are getting that transient monocular blindness it is pathognomic of the orbital disease commonly known as the orbital nerve sheath meningioma so i think uh, this can again be asked as a direct question that uh, when you have this optic nerve sheath meningioma the person could be having this gaze evoked amyrosis the possible mechanism is the inhibition of axonal impulses or the transient optic nerve ischemia could also be there then talking about the visual field effects uh, they are saying that uh, they uh, will be dealing them with the separate chapters uh, coming to the night blindness now another important thing is uh, you have seen so many places we have a clumsy vision during the daytime so many places we have got the clumsy vision during the night time so day blindness and the night blindness inability to see in the low light conditions occurs most frequently uh, dim light conditions is crudely uh, night blindness so this uh, we see in retinitis pigmentosa xerophthalmia pathological myopia then it can be a familial congenital condition and um, why we have this whenever we have a problem with the functioning of the rods in xerophthalmia symptom is a manifestation of deficiency of the fat soluble vitamin it also occurs in the diseases of liver like cirrhosis or with the use of phenothiazines or it may be associated with certain symptoms of neurosis and malignant and so the common ones you already know you know retinitis pigmentosa uh, pathological or high myopia then we know about uh, the vitamin a deficiency then you can learn some of the more one whenever we are having the problem with the liver or uh, the drugs also the phenothiazines i think this is important because uh, nowadays there is a trend of uh, asking the questions related to the ocular side effects of the systemic drugs that is why again i have recorded a separate video on the ocular side effects of the systemic drugs also then um, as against uh, the night blindness we can also have a day blindness that is called as the hemarlopia so when there is a inability to see clearly in the bright light due to the poor light adaptation that is called as the hemarlopia we can have cone dystrophy achromatopsia is a, is a rare cause and uh, aniridia albinism or the use of trimethadione so when the person is not able to see clearly in the daylight so daylight may uh, like uh, they are talking about the actual problem with the cones but the relative day blindness we were seeing in the nuclear cataract posterior subcapsular cataract cupuliform type of cortical cataract there also we were getting the day blindness but uh, if i talk about the actual cones problem it can be a cone dystrophy it can be achromatopsia uh, iris is not there so it's not able to take the light or this is albinism and the, another important one is the usage of the drug that is trimethadione so in this series today we have seen some of the important symptoms uh, their symptomatology what is their pathology what are the uh, different causes and what is the positive and negative history that you should take along with the dds of the day blindness and the night blindness this is all uh, for this session the part 1 of the chapter number 7 in the next section we'll be discussing from the color blindness thank you and happy ophthalmology